Hello folks. So as promised in today's Zoom class, I'm coming back with a recording of part two of the chapter on theories, and this is looking at the contemporary theories. Remember in part one I mentioned that the contemporary theories that we were going to use are derived from conflict theory, or at least conflict theory is their point of origin. So first up, we have feminist theory. Feminist theory takes the idea of inequality and resources being un unequally shared between groups in society where resources can be things like power, reputation, money, respect, and instead of looking at largely economics as the basis for that conflict, feminist theory looks at sex assigned at birth as the, um, the dominant area or the dominant source of that conflict, where traditionally in the majority of societies, not all, men have had more power than women and they've had more control over resources. If you look back at the US, say a hundred years ago, where only a male, only men could initiate divorce, um, men were the ones who worked out, you know, out in society and women were largely confined to working in the domestic sphere, working at home. Um, if a woman had a paid job, then her paycheck was not issued to her, but it was, her pay would be given to either her father, her husband, or, or her brother. You know, a male in the family had to come and pick up her pay. So feminist theory recognizes those or studies those inequal those types of inequalities that still exist in society today. Gender studies, on the other hand, rather than looking at sex, you know, assigned sex as the basis for inequality, is looking at gender identity and gender representation, or gendered representation. And in sociology, it's recognized that gender is something that is socially constructed. The idea that we expect certain types of dress, manners of speech, gestures, behaviors, careers, interests to be associated with one sex or another is an expectation based on what we think is appropriate behavior associated with that sex. And that is the definition of gender. Queer theory grew out of emerging or a relationship between feminist theory and gender studies. It looks at things as being, it looks at things as being related to both sex and society's gendered expectations. The most basic explanation of queer theory is that it challenges these binary contrasts and expectations, particularly where gender and sexuality are concerned and it looks at both of them as sexually constructed rather than being essentialist or inherent. Essentialist meaning that it is built into the essence of who we are. You know, if you were born with the anatomy of a male or a female, then essentialists would say your interests, your behavior, etc. are tied to the essence of your sex assigned at birth they were inherent in your genetic and personal construct. In this context, the word queer is being used to, to mean rejecting mainstream expressions of all types of behavior, including gender and sexuality. Queer theory concerns itself with the non-normative expressions of gender, sexuality, and identity, which is kind of ironic because right there, when it uh, defines something as being non-normative, it is also having difficulty separating itself from binary contrasts, from the idea of a system that is divided in two. You know, there is normative and there is non-normative. <clears throat> Queer theorists believe that our identities are fluid and changing, both for different people and within the same person at different times. So queer theory is recognizing this, this wide spect spectrum or continuum of normal. 
it recognizes that even if we are cisgendered and heterosexual, there is still the capacity within us for there to be some fluidity. You know, you might be a woman who enjoys carpentry, which is typically seen as a masculine activity. You might be a man who particularly enjoys knitting, which is seen as a typically feminine activity. Those would be examples of the idea that you know, we don't fit into tidy boxes, that each of us, you know, even if we identify with the normative, within each of us there is this potential for fluidity and change. For queer theorists, sexuality is a complex array of social codes and forces, forms of individual activity, and institutional power. And these things interact to shape the ideas of what we consider normative and what's considered deviant at any particular moment. And they then operate under the rubric of what we call natural, essential, biological, or even God-given. So, what this means in plain English. When queer, queer theorists are looking at sexuality, sexuality, you know, by definition, is about who we're attracted to, who we feel um, physical attraction, sexual attraction for. Okay, Our sexuality is not as, for many people, is not as innate as we, as we tend to think. We have been inundated with social codes and messages and expectations for our entire lives that tell us what society thinks is proper and what society thinks is improper. Think of that as the normative and the deviant. The normative is what we consider normal, proper. The deviant is anything that falls outside of that narrow scope. And in relation to sexuality, how we're going to behave as individuals is determined by those codes and forces, as well as by the power of our institutions to continue to reinforce those. Think about going to school as a child. As a child, there was a boy's bathroom and a girl's bathroom. There was the boy's line and the girl's line. You know, if your teacher was particularly annoyed with the boys and girls, maybe the boys sat on one side of the classroom and the girls sat on the other. As you got a little older, you know, boys played football, girls could play tennis. Um, when I was in school, you know, we had home ec and sewing and cooking classes. And boys got to do things like wood shop and another one I'll tell you about later, which I'm still bitter about. So um, anyway, the idea was the institution, our institutions themselves gave us messages about what was considered appropriate for us to engage in or not. Once all of this structure has been built around us, because we're just inheriting these ideas and we're inheriting this way of thinking and behaving, and it's been in place for so long, we're not likely to question it. And society itself, and then consequently we, look at it as being, you know, as con um, aligning our behaviors and conforming to these norms, we see them as natural. We see them as essential to a functional society. We see them as being ascribed to our biology. It's, you know, because little girls are naturally more caring that they want to play house and play mommy all the time and nurture their dolls. And it's because boys are, you know, they have more testosterone and so that's why they want to play with trucks and toy guns and so forth. Or we can throw in the religious aspect and say that, you know, it has been ordained by a deity. Teresa Dolores was the one who coined the term queer theory. She, is, she has her doctorate in modern language and literatures, and she was a professor in the history of consciousness at UC Santa Cruz. History of consciousness is a department that does interdisciplinary studies in the humanities.
So instead of taking a narrow approach, like you know, we're going to look at it from a strictly sociological perspective, um, history of consciousness would take something and look at it and say, okay, let's look at it from the sociological, let's look at it from the psychological, the anthropological, and let's draw in how these things are represented in art, how these messages are conveyed through literature, so that we can get a broader picture. In the theory as she, as she created it, she outlined the central features of queer theory, sketching the field in broad strokes that have held up remarkably well over time. She suggested that gay and lesbian sexualities should be studied on their own terms and not as deviations of heterosexuality. And this is, I mean, this is a huge paradigm shift. When we're looking at for decades, actually in the U, on the North American continent, 150, 200, 300 years, that gay and lesbian sexualities were described as alternative. One of my professors even described herself as a woman of alternative lifestyle when she would come out to her classes. Um, so they were looked at as alternative and so to suggest that these aren't deviations, these aren't just alternatives, these are sexualities that exist on their own terms, was significant. She claimed that gay and lesbian sexualities should be understood and imagined as forms of resistance to cultural homogenization, counteracting dominant discourses. That in itself is a fascinating way of looking at it, because what she's saying here is that gay and lesbian sexualities are a, are a way of resisting the dominant idea that everyone needs to be the same. That's the homogenization. That we all need to be alike and accept these same type, and accept similar types of identities and statuses in society. Finally, she asserted that lesbian and gay sexualities enact non-normative, intimate, and social modes of relating, putting new things in the world that have transformative potential. I like that final thought because it puts a really positive angle on it. <clears throat> it's not just that it's non-normative. It's not just that it's a different way of relating. It's the idea that gay and lesbian sexualities can actually introduce something into our world and into our society that can be life-changing, that can you know, transform some major aspect of society. I'm going to stop this video right here because I have a 15-minute time limit and we'll pick up in the next part.